as we told you before, this is a different flavor of the CTO challenge. So you will not be judged. And I'm not sitting in the judge's seat either. Um, glad you're here. Uh, a couple of questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, do we have more people than it are seated here who were part of the work? Absolutely. We had lots of contribution. Uh, would you raise your hand if you were part of the work? Cool. Um, I think at the end, I'd like to have everybody come up here, take a picture. All right. Um, and then, uh, did you feel like you got somewhere? It, it was a hard process, but in the end, we think we got to somewhere useful. Yeah. Great. Uh, on that note, <laughs> I assume you're the repertoire here. Yep, the, okay, rep, please do. Correct. So yeah, I'm, um, I'm going to leave the report out, but very much I'm the voice of a, of a, of a significant group effort. Um, if I could uh, ask for the, the slide deck to be put up, the one thing I'm going to do is what CTO challenges usually do and break the no, um, no PowerPoint rule. That's all right. And actually step through some imagery. Yeah. So let's do that. Um, first, I wanted to start with a cartoon because life starts with cartoons. So have a quick read of that. Right, it's a gentleman at a climate conference talking about all this good stuff and someone in the back of the audience saying, of course, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> and that always resonates with me very deeply, right? We, we have different human motivations for doing things and human motivation is perhaps at the crux of the entire process that we wound up landing on. Um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a very deep, very interesting thought. Um, so we're here to talk about plan A, global solar now. That's, that's one of the things, and we know that's the plan because it's on our shirts or it's on our, our team jackets. <laughs> and let's start with what that challenge actually is. So the challenge that we heard Mark give to us, um, uh, and actually I want to just pause and thank Mark both for setting the challenge. I want to hugely thank the, the design team that was put together for doing this work. Um, and we collectively enormously thank the folks that raised their hands. Um, and there were more folks that have had to disappear since that also would have raised their hands. Very much a process that's impossible to do in a vacuum. And um, that contribution is enormously, enormously beneficial to us. The breakouts were fabulous ways to constructively criticize and test what we were doing. They also taught us something very deep, which is this is a topic replete with enormously deep, enormously thin rabbit holes. There are many, many, many of them, and it's very hard not to find your individual rabbit hole and descend into it and get lost in that rabbit hole and lose track of the, lose track of the task. You know, it's an enormously human thing to do. I want to especially call out Stephen Honigman, one of the folks that contributed, and in particular, one of the folks that, that stayed through the inevitable late night sessions after dinner to try to, try to lasso a half-baked half presentation with lots of, lots of debatable things in it into something that maybe we hope slightly better. Um, so, Let's look at that challenge that Mark gave us, um, which I, I've put down in words as saying, deploy enough solar in five years to exceed 80% zero emission energy on the global energy grid. I wanna break that down in three ways because it's important that we don't just flick by that and get on with it. We need to understand the problem we're solving. So three questions derived from that, and they were hit, we were hit with that when we looked at, looked at this in the breakouts. Why solar? Why 80%? And why bother? So let's look at those things because they're really important. Why solar? Solar is the proxy for anything you can buy today whose production you can scale massively in the next five years that produces you know, a zero maintenance, zero emission result, and that doesn't rely on someone to develop a technology first. The technology already exists, you just have to ramp it. Doesn't mean you turn off all the zero emission stuff you've got, absolutely you don't. You've got a nuclear reactor that's running, obviously leave it on. Doesn't mean someone can't come along tomorrow with something that it meets and exceeds solar's pricing capability, bring it on. Solar is the proxy for a class of solutions of which there is currently only one. Why 80%? Um, because you need a target somewhere, 80% at five years. The point is, you don't stop at 80%. The point of this process is to build up a head of steam and then keep steaming. So that's why you set a target at all and you don't stop doing it when you get there. Uh, and why bother? Well, again, it's on the back of our team jackets, right? We need to save the planet. That's the overt reason for doing this. The other reasons for doing this is where we'll get to. If you're going to do this, if you're going to carpet bomb the world with solar, you do need two other things, technically, to, to turn that solar into useful human, like accessible electrical energy. You need energy storage on a scale that is matched to the solar. We'll come to what that scale looks like. But the point is you need to marry the solar with energy storage to time shift the energy. And you need intelligent demand and load control. You need to be smart about how you use the energy. You can lock probably a quarter of, 
a quarter of the task off by just being much smarter about when you use the energy, how you use the energy, how you can save energy, how you can time shift your load, not just your source of energy. But it's solar up front, and these things come along necessarily for the ride. Um, this is just meant to give us a sense of scale here. The point of this, of this chart is that there seem to be multiple believable sources that tell us that the total amount of energy that the world generates and consumes in a year, if you convert that energy into electricity equivalent, right? If you imagine it is all electricity versus just the outcome of burning stuff directly, the world consumes about 160,000 terawatt hours of energy. This is a really big number. To be proper SI unit about it, it's 160 petawatt hours of energy. And to, to, to get to it another way, we probably all got a, a sense of what a kilowatt hour looks like, right? That's a, you know, a, we burn a kilowatt hour in our homes doing something um, routinely. So 1,000 kilowatt hours is a megawatt hour, 1,000 megawatt hours is a gigawatt hour, 1,000 gigawatt hours is a terawatt hour, it's 160,000 of them. It's a real big number, but there are a lot of people on the planet. We decided to drill down, as Mark has invited us to, into, into one sub subset of that, the 15% of that total energy burn that the world runs through, that is electrical energy directly. So this is energy that's generated on the world's energy grids and consumed on the world's energy grids. And that number is about 15% of the total of 25,000 terawatt hours. So, hey, it's a smaller number, that's nice. Um, it's still a big number, but it's a small number, right? So that's where we decided to head to. And so taking a look at what we actually have to achieve in five years, we've got a kind of 15% completion bar on the download here, right? We're already 15% of the way there. We got 15% of the way there in the last 30, 40, 50 years already. Like all exponential curves, we're hoping that exponential aspect continues. So we're 15% of the way there, 80% of 25,000 is 20,000. That's what we want to hit in five years. So that's actually the, the overt challenge here. I mentioned energy storage. You do need to match it with energy storage. And in terms of practical ratios in the solar and battery deployment industry, the practical rule of thumb is that, is that you need to match every kilowatt hour of solar generation, sorry, every kilowatt of solar generation with two kilowatt hours of storage. So you need 20,000 terawatt hours of solar generation, and you need at least, obviously more is always better, 40,000 terawatt hours of energy storage. Let me put that in a, in a more personal context. If you get a 10 kilowatt solar system put on your roof, we're asking you to also put 20 kilowatt hours of battery storage on the wall, right? Two to one ratio. So two hours worth of that full output power into that thing, you get enough time shifting to fill in all the gaps. So that's the idea, a two to one ratio is what we base that on. And the base point though is a hell of a lot of storage. One of the challenges with the storage it is, is it's further back on the, on the creation delivery and cost down curve than the solar is. One obvious question, is there enough land mass in the world to, to actually even do this? And the answer, the answer to that piece at least is actually hell yes, there's plenty. Uh, this is a nice chart we found that, that is, in a, because the problem is global, hopefully not a picture of the US. Um, so this is, this is the little red squares are how much space you need to solve this problem in terms of the solar generation part of it mapped onto the continent of Africa. And the relevant one here I draw your attention to is the top left hand largest of those small squares is the amount of Africa you need to carpet bomb with solar to deliver all the energy we need. The problem of course is you don't want to deliver it all in that top left hand corner of Africa, you want to distribute it. But if you did all well, put it in one place, put all those panels in one place, that's how big they'd be. And we were actually quite impressed that that number that came from a different source actually matches the first number. So um, we are at least all equally inconsistent here. Where do you do this? Well, in practice, where do you put the stuff? You put it everywhere, you know, you put everything everywhere all at once, right? To, to use a movie line. You put it on rooftops, you put it on, the, on big box retailers, you put it at sources of use, wherever you've got the roof space to do it. And you make big power plants to replace our existing big power plants you do this, this is the company called 5B we mentioned the other day, that makes pre-built systems that you just pull out across the Australian desert and turn them on, have a nice day. All, all expert built in the factory and then relatively unskilled labor drags them out over the desert, get on with it. The point of that slide is 
you need this sort of acceleration, but that's, this, is, this is, doesn't need any new inventions, it just needs an awful lot of hard work. You generally put these things right down beside existing fossil fuel plants where all the big interconnectors are, but you are still gonna have to build some more distribution as well, because sometimes the places the fossil fuel plants are ain't the places that the sun shines the most. And why do you need energy storage? Just to state the obvious, because it does actually get dark at night. And, and the one downside of solar is that the solar itself, of course, doesn't store energy, so you've got to actually time shift it. People think about, sometimes describe batteries as generators, they're not, they're merely time shifters, they're buffers, and we do have to buffer it. But be aware that you don't have to buffer an entire nighttime worth of energy. You've got all sorts of things here, including interconnectors that go sideways across time zones, that mean you only have to fill in the gaps, and the gaps get filled in with a lot of intelligent use of software and demand control, much more than you might think. But that's why you need that too. Now, because we have some geeks here, we couldn't resist getting Excel out and doing some spreadsheeting. We kind of had to, really, because the core question is, if that problem is that big, can you even solve it? You know, assume infinite funds. Can you even solve the problem in the time allowed? How big is that problem? So here's the mandatory slide with lots of, lots of numbers that are too small to read on it. And, and the point of that is to, is to tell you the outcome of our modeling, not to ask you to follow along every tiny little number. We're more than happy to hand you the spreadsheet to let you do your own maths afterwards and shoot enormous holes in this. It's remarkable what you can do late at night with a glass of red, but it's not always right. <laughs> but here's the thing, here's the conclusion we came to. We, we decided on an aggressive but, but believable compound growth rate in the rate in which the global solar and battery deployment industry can deploy this stuff, right? The base question is, how aggressive can you be? And we decided about 35% was about as aggressive as we felt like it was plausible. In other words, you deploy X of this stuff in year zero, year one, you deploy 1.35X of that the next year, 1.35X of that the next year. So compound growth rate. At some level, it sounds, that still sounds like a scary number, but you know, it's nowhere near Elon grade ramp up rates. You know, he, he doubles production every year, right? That's 100% compound growth rate. We are merely doing 35. We did, however, think in the real world, if you're not Elon, the 60% you need to get this done in five years is too aggressive. So, so 35% doesn't get it done in five years. I'm sorry, I'm glad you're not judging us because we failed. It's gonna take seven years, not five. At year five, you've actually got halfway there. The magic of compounding numbers means that two years later, you've actually got all the way to the magic 20,000 terawatt hours for 80%. And of course you don't stop. And in fact, the, the year eight column actually hits the 100% bar, it turns out. It's not there, but another 35% actually exceeds that 25,000 terawatt hours. A couple of important parameters in the bottom for people that like putting numbers into spreadsheets to get the answer they want. Um, one of them is you've got to assume a ratio of how much power does one panel make in a year. Uh, how many, if you've got a one kilowatt panel, how many kilowatt hours do you make in a year? The ratio we used was 1,400 kilowatt hours. It's a reasonable industry metric. You can play with it, right? The other thing we used was a cost metric. The industry in the US today builds at a profit the system we're describing. So let's say 10, 10 kilowatts of solar on your roof, 20 kilowatt hours of batteries on your wall for four bucks a watt. So in other words, 40 grand, 10 kilowatts on the roof, 20 kilowatt hours of storage on the site, all the electronics, all the permitting, all the profit, and implicitly the fully loaded cost of building the factory to make the damn stuff happen. The point of that is to try to derive a worst case cost for what it cost the world to do it, including what it was already gonna spend. Okay, we haven't tried to subtract that. And that answer is, is you know, these numbers get small if you scale them down. It's a mere 49 trillion US dollars over that, over that seven years, I might add. So it's not so bad, right? Not so bad at the start. It's a hell of a lot of money, but it's actually in a, in, against a global GDP of circa 100 trillion US dollars. And remember, that's the total over seven years. It's not an entirely unbelievable number. So we just wanted to believe, we just wanted to feel like it was possible for the world to ramp this fast if it decided to, and that's the key, right? Briefly though, the rest of the 167,000 terawatt hours, the reason why you don't do that in the first five years is that none of that uses electricity. It burns stuff directly. So we have to convert the rest of that from burning stuff, you know, in your car, or in your office, in your factory, into being able to consume electricity instead, and then you add more solar to, to manage that. If you, if you did this enormous wartime grade ramp up to year seven and then just stayed flat, it would take 35, 36 years to do the rest. Of course, you don't stay flat, you keep growing. But our point to you is this, the constraint for the rest of it is not this, it's the capacity of the world to transition its use of energy to electricity from not electricity. 
So that's a, another greater problem. This having been ramped up can keep up with it. It can keep up with the rate at which Elon sells you cars, for instance, right? But that won't happen instantly. So that's, that was where we kind of left that piece. Back to the real business case, save the planet. Why? Why is that an economic business case? Because the thesis is that natural disasters, natural in the sense that we cause them, mass population displacement, wars, not the wars we have today, but wars about access to life critical human resources like water and food and a place to, to hang your hat. These are really expensive things. And while we can go and create the Thunderbirds International Rescue to go out and save stuff, after a while it gets real expensive. But of course, we all understand the key barrier to doing that today is, is, social, is societal inertia. You know, yeah, okay, I'll save the world tomorrow. And vested interests, the people that currently make their living doing what they currently do, and that these days have been hiring the same guys the tobacco industry used successfully for so long to delay the inevitable, because every day you delay the inevitable is super profitable. And if that is, you know, that's the challenge about a profit-driven corporation, it exists to generate a profit. Can't blame them, but that's the barrier. So the challenge here really, and it always has been the challenge, is not technology. And we descended into enormous technological rabbit holes, geographically specific ones, geographically non-specific ones. We could be talking about rabbit holes for the next year and not even touch the side of the rabbit holes. But they are all second tier problems. Second tier problems. The first tier problem is convincing the world of the need to do it at all. Not a technology challenge, absolutely correct. You need other compelling reasons to do this. Key point is those compelling reasons are specific to geographies, specific to mind share, specific to government structure. In the USA, it might be that we have to beat China at their own game, or we have to be secure in terms of energy delivery, or national security, or you know, their, you know, resiliency, all these good reasons. In a democratic society, you might need to convince the population to vote somebody that's right in. In China, you might just need to convince President Xi to get on with it. Right, the, 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 what the, the conversation to achieve that sales process is different in every place. And even deciding how big each place is is difficult. Maybe it's not, you know, it's, it might, in China it might be a country thing, in the US it might be a state thing or even a, you know, a local thing, how you convince that jurisdiction to get on with it. The hooks will be different. Assuming that you somehow magically do that, this is how you do that, okay? This is not the, the how you cause it to happen, but this is what you do if you can actually make it happen. A five-step plan that we came up with, you want to know your audience. You need to understand its culture and its government structure in each of those geographic areas. Point zero, work out what the geographic splits are. You need to understand in that area the local electrical infrastructure and the regulatory environment that is unique, quite likely, to that area. The those things are unique in all US states from each other because as a visitor to your country, I'll say, you're so damn independent between these states that you'll never do it all exactly the same. That's a challenge here, right? You need to understand the market mechanisms and the business cases that you would therefore apply in that particular place. You need to figure out who to convince, and then you need to start convincing them, right? Customized messages built in great detail for each of those places, and customized chatbots that might help you actually complete that sales process to educate and inspire those people and get on with it. The money alone is not the problem. The money is, in a lot of senses, was never the problem. Um, now, the challenge is that we, have all seen this movie before. And the last time I saw this movie in a, in a significant way was in 2006 when Al Gore made a movie called An Inconvenient Truth and laid out all of the same source issues and laid out the correct message, which is, it's not too late, let's get on with it. And he also had a shot at this, this, because he actually set up, he worked on setting up an actual network of humans to descend the world, to train them in delivering that in that message and to customize that message for local geographies and get it out there and train the trainer and build an entire hierarchy to virally distribute the message and the need to the population of the world. And that was 17 years ago, and it didn't work. What a shit. It didn't work, I wish it had. 17 years in a scale where we're trying to do it in five? Wouldn't it be nice if we started then? Um, so that's the challenge. So the real thing we sat down and, and figured out after that, after a lot of conversation, a lot of, in, a lot of kind of contribution actually from, from people around us was, so what the hell has changed between 2006 and 2023 that might possibly make a difference? And the thing that changed turns out to be a core theme this week, it's, it's AI. What changed, the hint was in the chatbot piece of this, right? 
we as humans can't scale to convince all of the other billions of humans about this problem. So the, the real thought we have here is to challenge our AIs, to find an AI mechanism to do that work for us, including working out the geographies. And it's not a cop-out, it's exactly what AI is supposed to do for us, take local intelligence and apply it hyper-locally, hyper-local sales process, et cetera. Now, we're all aware, and it's been a topic of conversation this week, that uh, uh, the notion of evil AI spam bots impersonating people sitting inside your social media feed trying to convince you of something subversive and pretending to be a human. Well, we want to take the bad stuff and use it for good. More importantly, this would not be masquerading as a human. It would be saying, I am your artificial intelligence solution to the problem that you don't have time to think about. We're not going to pretend they're humans. We're going to absolutely say they're technology that's here to help you. That's absolutely the path here that we think makes sense because the solution here is hyper-localized because each one of us has a conversation that they have to have with themselves about this. And I know from brutal experience and any of you that have had conversations like this over time that it's all about convincing each damn individual and it's a hard task. So AI is the, is the circuit breaker that we think is, is an important part of the mechanism here. Last but not least then, what do we do about all of that? Well, a great, great proposition we got in the, in the second breakout is we need a pitch deck. And we didn't build the pitch deck, but that's actually what we think we need to do next, right? We actually need to build a pitch deck to say, AI is the secret source to deliver the convincing arguments to the world to get the hell on with what it needs to get on with. Because the deep point here is that most humans don't find mitigating climate change to be a convincing reason to do this. There's 20 other great reasons, profitable business reasons. Um, electric cars exist here because the California Air Resources Board, two or three decades ago, wanted to clean up pollution in the air in California. It was nothing to do with greening the planet. It was about the health implications, the health profit of not killing people with particulate air pollution. There are lots of other reasons. So we need to use AI to generate those and get it out there. We need a pitch deck to go fund that. And then we need to shove that under the noses of people who can make a difference. It's world leaders, but in the modern world, it's also tech billionaires. Not because we want their money, but because we want their influence. That's it. And now we should talk about it. <laughs> wow. My, my first thought after listening to this is we need to have another quote that says, get on with it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, so how would you like to discuss this? One of the things we got out of the breakout was that every time we went down any direction here, we had someone else giving us another direction to consider. There are a lot of things that we considered and could not include in this. And so one proposition I've got for you is if those of you that are there and feel like you really want to get another point across about this, stand up on a mic and get it across, mm -hmm. right? There are, there are no wrong answers in terms of trying to get some voices out of here, so we could do that. Sure. Um, we could do it Q&A, or we can do it another way. Sure, okay. And I, what, what I thought you were going to say, so I'll say it. Okay, please. Could have been you. Um, after this is all done, mm. we need to have a website of some Sorry. kind right. where you can sign up you know, any time, day or night, and briefly describe what you're good at and what you care about and what you want to do. Yeah, it's a great And idea. see if you can kind of be sorted into the right place yep. physically and functionally. Yeah, and, and actually we'd love, we'll do that, and we'd love to start out with the folks that turned up in the breakout and had opinions. We would like to, to, to actually understand who you are and, and start, start actively involving it. Yeah, right. That makes sense. Well, let's take a two-phase approach here. Yep. Um, is there anybody other than you in the team who would like to say anything before we go to the audience? How about a big thank you to Simon for reporting out for all of us? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. And in, in, in return, I need to give an enormous vote of thanks to, to Alana, who, who took a whole lot of chicken scratchings and turned them into something that wasn't ugly. Um, <laughs> so another follow-on question, and then I'll... Um, I asked you in, in a different form the same question, which is, did it feel to you like you got somewhere. Um, in doing this week together, did you end up with a different sense of heart and soul about not just could it be done, but you wanted it to be done? Does plan A have magic in it? 
Yeah, it, the, what has magic in it is finding the hook for getting the world to start. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean that's obviously the deep message. Yeah. And, and the magic is we in a technology conference want to find some technology to help. That tech is actually not all of the electronic tech, it's AI. Yeah, okay. So that's the piece that gave us a chance to hope about this rather than just say it's all too hard, it can't possibly happen. Great, good. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. I think it's really brilliant, so must be good. <laughs> Anybody else on stage? Ella? Well, I have to say, I watched um, Mark's face as we were presenting, and it was a little bit gruff most of the time, but then when you said AI, you lightened up and <laughs> smiled. So um, if that means anything, I'm, I'm glad we tapped into something that resonates. Um, the other thing I'll say is for me, you know, I'm really more of a hearts and minds person. I come to the team as the marketer, right? Um, and I was fascinated with the process of getting to our number, which is sort of backwards for me, right? I normally start with the psychology and with, with the heart and um, that gut feeling, right, that we think about with branding exercises. But it feels really important with something like this that you have to define your number and have that top line number that we can then start building back against. So it was a really interesting process. I think, you know, just one comment, the sessions themselves is how passionate everybody was, right? How passionate people were to contribute. So that was, I mean, it just says something about this community here of, of we care, right? And, and if we can just impart part of that to these robots that will go out there and, and, and bring that into the populace, I think we can bring about meaningful change. So I think that's, that was one effect that from a personal side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to add on to that, I think that what was really insightful for me was the numbers actually came out decently well. Yeah. And I was generally surprised in that. Uh, this is a big mission, um, and it's a, on a global scale. And although 50 trillion sounds like a lot of money, um, <laughs> I hope to everybody in this room, um, if not, come talk to me yeah. after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have I got uh, a bridge? Yeah. yeah. But... Actually, having seen those numbers broken down gave me uh, inspiration that this is doable. And at the core, obviously, there's going to be some government, you know, the governments are the ones that have that kind of funds. But at the core of it was, we want to go down up, because you're not going to really change those governments or incentivize them without the populace's help. Um, and that's what the true core of our kind of mission was, was to build that down up process knowing that there is a possibility and our only way is to access those higher up high level funds um, and so that 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 really surprised me and I, I loved how we broke it down and then kind of dove into a new novel way to approach it and the final thing I'll say is you know I feel like a lot of us have been fighting the battle for a long time for for many decades so we've heard a lot of the different arguments you know like we said Al Gore did this in 2006 and he's been pushing this messaging. So what has changed in that time? And I think that's exactly how you frame it. What has changed in that time and what can we utilize now to effect a greater change? So that's what I enjoyed about it. Thank you, yeah. Will. I think uh, I was pushing whole like, like two days because I'm a consultant by training. So we are always forecasting, trying to make the plans. And always when you make these plans, they're overwhelming. And when it comes to you know, decarbonization, one thing which is missing in the conversation always is conservation, like in a sense, how we can change the behavior. If you ask me what you can do getting out of this room tomorrow and make an impact is the change in your behavior. See, you can shave off 25% of what we are presenting and your goal can come in five years. If you can all pledge that, okay, mm -hmm. we are going to conserve and not use the energy Good because yeah. we are, Tremendously, like since, uh, since I am from a developing country where we use, had a lot of less amount of energy to do work. When I came to US, one of the things was startling for me was that we always assume that lights are on like this and we just keep it on. We never, like, you know, we never had even switch on off switches like many places in 2007. We are changing and these technologies can help. I'm not asking like you to drastically change the behavior, but use the technology, right? Like to make five degree change in the temperature in your home can make a lot of difference. So I think that aspect is very, very important to this kind of equation. Yeah. It, it, brings, the, it brings up the question of the men's room over here. 
Um, because, you know, of course they have motion detection, I guess, I don't know, something. Maybe it's my aftershave. <laughs> uh, but, but the lights come on when you walk in. And big hotels in Denmark do the same thing. So um, why wouldn't everyone always all have that? If you're not in the room, you don't need the lights on. Yeah. If just, just that one object given away for free. Yeah. Um, oh, good idea. Yeah. yeah, I think we have evidence. Like, you know, biggest thing in, in US has happened in the last 10, 15 years is LED lights. And it has kind of crashed the load, like the load growth kind of really changed because of LED lights. People started switching from you know, the normal bulb to LED. Like think about the simplicity of that. We could have done it long, but like that can make a difference. Yeah, So good point. Yeah. Well, so um, we should ask, should we start with those who raised their hands? Is that a good step two here? Yeah, or those, those that have raised those, their feet. So they're here. Yeah, okay. they're, they're. All right, <laughs> uh, let's go ahead, please, John. Yeah, so in our advisory board discussions. So planning, John, we have this really cool idea where you say your name. Oh, okay. And then uh, later John, on we know who you were. John Madison. Um, in our planning sessions for this event, uh, one of the things we discussed is um, how the, and Dennis highlighted this in his talk, is that there's an accelerating impact it's not just a linear impact, it's accelerating. And that by this time next year, there's gonna be very few people who can deny that climate change is profoundly impactful. What Will and I talked about earlier this morning is the fact that, that we're, we're still at the state where there's enough denial, where it's very challenging and discouraging, but that's gonna flip very soon when the economic impacts of climate change, hurricanes, floods, droughts, crop failures become much more prominent. And so what Will and I talked about this morning is there's a short window between now we've got the motivation to act and so busy playing whack-a-mole with natural disasters that we have no resources to invest in this mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, that I think we need to do um, is to uh, future-proof this initiative in the short term for the discouragement that will come until such time is there when there's a wider recognition of the economic impact and have the plan ready to really accelerate in a huge way. So I don't think we can do 20% uh, of the work each year for the next five years. I think what we need to do is lay the groundwork for when it becomes apparent to everybody that we can't win by playing whack-a-mole and we need to heavily invest. And the second point I wanted to make is to the, uh, the, the point aptly made about the discussions that everybody's got a rabbit hole that they want to go down very deeply. I think one of the criteria for our work groups going forward ought to be, you've got an idea to do something different. You've just been volunteered to lead that work. Yeah. Um, and otherwise, it'll be very, very distracting because it'll be easy to say the plan we had is not working because we're not getting enough traction. But I think that's the natural course we should anticipate until there's that tipping point in support. Yeah, I think you're right. Thank you. I think just to comment on that, one of the issues is, is kind of um, an action and response, right? So if we go ahead with this plan and we, we tell people, well, we do this and, and things are going to get better, well, the problem is they will not, right? The, the reality, unfortunately, is, is that the CO2 loading is such that, that this will continue no matter if we did start this today. Obviously, 50 years, 100 years down the road, it will impact in a very positive way, and, and, and clearly that's why we should do this. But I think that's going to be part of the issue of convincing the populace you know, we would have done this, and, and it's, a, it's a great way with that cartoon, right? We've made the world a better place, but everyone's going to look around themselves and say, you know, well, why did we spend all this money even though we're breathing a lot better and the air quality is... So, but that's part of this problem, right? There's a delayed gratification effect, if you will, to this problem. Hi, Greg Brando. Hey, um, I went to the breakout yesterday to listen to what you said, and of course I was the one that brought up what was this gonna cost and how does that look in terms of what we actually spend in the world. Um, and the simple calculation that in the US, the entire federal budget rounded up is $5 trillion a year, okay? And we're talking on this, 49 trillion. So it's a lot of money, okay? And that money that they're, we're currently spending is paying for Medicare, paying for Social Security, paying for defense, and so forth, right? 
So you're talking about doubling the U.S. budget, or and that's just in the U.S. And when you did the numbers worldwide, it is $6,000 per person for this entire project, for every single person in the world, right? So I'm just saying and cautioning that, you know, we have put in over the past 100 years this whole infrastructure, and it took a certain amount of time and investment, right? Um, so the work you guys did, fantastic, illustrates the problem. Uh, but we also need to think about now, okay, you're not gonna see immediate changes, right? You're uh, not gonna be able to convince everybody. There's 12 other ways of doing this that everybody's gonna say, right? Uh, it seems that like natural gas might be a smart thing for all the coal plants um, and so on. So I just think that we need to have a few other avenues here. Be oh, and I'm sorry, uh, Navneet put up a, a great point, which is conservation, brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. You could make a huge difference in doing that, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so I'm just saying that it's a lot of money. And even if you just said, okay, everybody in the world, you have to spend this money, it's not clear that that's gonna happen. Yeah. You know, Greg, I'll add one thing to that, which is we talked about um, consumers being a part of the change and making sure that consumers are given choices that you know, make a lot of sense. Um, I'm, I'm curious in this room, how many of you live uh, underneath a roof? <laughs> right? So everyone should have their hands up, or if you live in like some weird yurt that's like open top, okay, all right. But we all live under a roof, right? So, so there are opportunities for the consumer to influence this. And so just taking that huge top line number and assigning it to you know, one entity and saying that's, that's really big. That's something that, that we grappled with and that overwhelms us. But when we flip the script and think about how consumers can drive that change, um, there's a possible through line there. 100% agree. So carbon tax made a big difference. Somebody talked about this in Australia, that for one period of time that made a difference. Another thing we could look at. Yeah, just to touch on that Great last idea. point, um, the carbon tax, yeah, just exactly. Australia, for a brief period, had a government that, that put in a direct carbon tax, said, this is a pollutant, we're gonna tax the, tax the pollution, which has happened in the history of the world with other pollutants. And that was the only time that Australia's carbon intensity actually went down for a while, and then the law got flipped by the next government, and <laughs> the carbon intensity started rising again. Yeah. And the correlation is 100% direct. Yeah. But, but the, the v existing vested interests in Australia have done something remarkable, actually taken the carbon tax off the discussion agenda for both major parties somehow. This is kind of this mind control that's happened. It seems so obvious. And, and so, and this coming back to my original point, just says that the, the barriers here are, are country and geography specific. The, the point that Greg- there. Carbon tax in California, I pay 58 cents a kilowatt hour for my, uh, uh, electricity. My brother lives in Nebraska. He pays eight cents a kilowatt hour. He says all his neighbors do nothing about conserving energy. I spend a lot of energy conserving energy. <laughs> Greg, Greg brought up something which we addressed here on this, this stage about 10 years ago. And Larry Smyer was part of that. And we had a very smart guy from um, Caltech who was a judge and who was the opening night speaker, and who gave a very passionate and well-reasoned speech about how it was impossible to, uh, to avoid the 1.5. Right. And then we made him a judge, and then this team went away, wherever, and they came back on Friday that week, and they reported out, and, and Nathan said, you're right, <laughs> you, I was wrong. That took a lot, you know, and so what, what they said was, this is a two-phase answer, not a one-phase answer. And he said, the reason there's so much frustration is everyone's trying to have a one answer. Is it wind? Is it solar? And it's not, it, they said that you got it all wrong. It, there are two phases. Phase one is 20 to 30 years, and it's going to be um, uh, natural gas replacing coal. And while that's happening, you're going to be building out renewables. And after whatever this is, phase one, you turn off the natural gas, and now you've got 100% renewables. So if you kind of search and replace the number of years, um, I think you, there, there are other simultaneous equations that are in this room we haven't talked about. Uh, the number one in my mind is oil and gas companies doing all they can to make it, this a hard thing to do. So what you really want to do is help them make money. 
mm -hmm. we're back to Dennis again. And so um, the, the, the number two is China, which is just the hell with you. We don't care about you anymore. We're going to be China. And they're still building coal plants every week. So um, I think if you wanted to solve both those in one go, you would make more and more and more natural gas. And you would somehow do a deal like Newsom maybe tried to do last week with China, where you go, look, here's the deal. We're going to give you natural gas at 10 cents, what, half price, a third of the price. We know you guys don't have that much. We have a lot. We're going to make more. It's all for you. You buy it at a special discount called the green discount. And Mr. G can be famous for that. And then you're going to take over each coal plant, shut that thing back down, and turn it into a natural gas plant within a year. And by doing that, that changes everything. Then, then we've done the impossible. Basically, we've taken the biggest um, uh, saboteur off of the, the, the deck because the oil and gla gas companies would buy that deal, I think. Mm -hmm. And you've taken the biggest uh, bad behavior, bad actor, without whom we can't, no matter what we do, it won't matter. And we've, been, we've made them our, our partner. Yeah, it's a deep point that, that while we looked at a static set of numbers, there's countries like China that are busy making it worse as fast as possible yeah, yeah. right now because that's currently the best economics. So you're yes. right, you modify the economic inputs yeah. so they'll then follow the new economic yes. breadcrumb. I think that would work. Yeah. yeah. I think, Mark, what you just said is like classic energy transition, right? Mm. The problem is people are on one side, like they just want green, 100% green right now. I know. And that blocks even the sensible things to do, just like what you I know. That's it's it's like watching the Democratic Party in the United States fight with each other all night long. Yes. Um, one reason we were so dictatorial in our description of Plan A, we didn't say, what's the best technology to use? We said, it's going to be solar. Right. Um, you know, we said, we're not going to have any debate anymore, debate to their internet, deny. That's over with. So that's part of Plan A, actually. So we're not asking people for their opinion yeah. about wind or whatever. You know, we're just saying, here's the deal. It's called Plan A. It's going to work. You can read the book. We'll make a book or something and, and get on it now. Mm -hmm. Get to it, I think. Yeah. Get to it. Yeah. Uh, where Come are we on there? with it, right? Yep. Simon, uh, Mark Sox, Pattern Computer. Thank you for leading us the last 48 hours. It uh, <laughs> was remarkable. We went down a lot of rabbit holes, so we probably ought to call ourselves Alice in Wonderland because we we found a lot of them. But one I want to highlight, and you brought it up on the slides, and that's the action plan. You know, so what do we do next, and how do we win the hearts and the minds? So, Mark, fire films. Can we crank one out in about 60 days? That's that's not a gloom and doom. It's not an Al Gore. Oh my God, we're all going to die. But paints a kind of different a different picture, a different reason for why we want to do this. And then on our website, which I'm sure we'll put together at some point, each of us contributing what we're personally doing to take these first steps. Are you adding solar to your roof? Or are you writing an article? Or are you working with your local PUD to perhaps you know, change some local regulatory? Something that we're each personally engaged in. If we don't do that, this is just a great talk. You know, we'll come back next year and we'll admire you know, how much we talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we can start with the people that are here and the capabilities we have here. Yeah, I was going to say we have a bunch of filmmakers here. Absolutely, so, yeah. Uh, but, but the point being, this yeah. is brought out over and over, it, yeah. it is not a gloom and doom story. You turn right. off half the audience if you do right. make this a positive story. Right. And you'll win the hearts and the minds. Yeah, and we take Dennis's advice. We glue a $5 bill to the side of each thing and we send it through the mail. Whatever it takes. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, thank. <clears throat> thank you very much. That was a great, uh, great report out, Simon. <laughs> um, on the demand side, I just wanted to, I, I can't resist mentioning uh, Bitcoin mining, which now uh, uses as much power as Argentina, the entire nation. And it's completely unnecessary. Yeah, you should make, you know, the, the, for this purpose, you should just damn well make that illegal. Exactly. It's, it's insane. Exactly. Because there are lots of, there are plenty of cryptocurrencies that don't use Bitcoin mining. It's just, just a bad idea. Um, but uh, I, I also wanted to say on the, essentially what we're talking about is building a huge marketing plan. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as we really got into that discussion, we went, <laughs> went in a lot of different directions trying to understand who, who to influence and and, and I think the main thing that came out of it for me is we'll need lots of different messages, lots of different messengers uh, for the first time that the, the tech really exists. But I see this as partly just a challenge of building a team of uh, marketers, and a lot of them are gonna have to be Chinese. Uh, Mark made that as one of the you know, criteria in the beginning for this plan was that we need to get China on board with this or it won't work. 
And so uh, I, I think sort of thinking of it as building a huge campaign with a lot of players. There was also an idea to create a climate core, sort of like the Peace Corps, to get youth involved. And you know, we've heard about how isolated and unhappy people are. And I think having a chance to actually do th do something would be very powerful. And just just by way of agreeing with you, the more nuanced message than "Hey, it's okay, AI will do all the work for us," is AI augmented human effort to make it happen. Is yeah. is what you're talking about? And I'm yeah, agreeing. Nice, with you. nicely. Right. Yeah. Thank you, John. Hi, uh, Mia Champion, and um, loved the presentation. It was also a privilege to be able to participate in some of the sessions with this amazing group of, of people. Um, so I just wondered, you know, when this plan works, <laughs> to be very optimistic, um, what about all those consumers that are convinced or, you know, be become convinced by these efforts but feel blocked because maybe they feel like they can't budget in solar panel installation into their home, would it benefit to also have sort of a parallel top-down strategy for maybe you know providing like uh, tax breaks or um, a subsidy program for those that feel that they can't afford or budget this in to get financial help? Or, Absolutely. You know things like that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and we know enough now about how that works that we do. About how, you can about make money. Everyone makes money, right? The government can do it and make money. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just to agree with, agree with the notion of you've got to spend a lot of money, but you don't have to spend it all right now. The way South Australia, my native state, wound up with an almost 50% rooftop penetration in solar was the government's deci government deciding to offer a 20-year very high feed-in tariff incentive to export energy from your roof. Like, I'm talking about 60, 70, 80 cents per kilowatt hour, and you're going to get it for 20 years. And the point is that means the government knows how much money it's going to pay you as an incentive, but it's going to pay you over the next 20 years. You don't have to find it now. It's actually, it's a time payment plan for the government investment. And it worked. It caused this enormous amount of consumer decision to spend their dime to put solar on their roof. I think, you know, part of the thing is also it's, it's this whole concept of the chatbots and, and, and how to convince them. And so you do not convince at the government level when you start. You convince actually at, at the people level, yeah. right? And, and finding those super spreaders, if you will, that can relay that concept. And once you have that critical mass, you then influence the political change. Once you have that political change, you can start to answer then those problems of how to make it easier for people to acquire this technology. Because that's what you would want. I just want to add one, like, very one quick thing, because you're all technology people and I am in the industry. To get a financing done for a solar project is incredibly tough for the end consumer. If you can do anything like, you know, is we are trying to do heat pump and if you want to apply, it takes 60 days for you to get an answer. Like where people want to get the answers on their kitchen table, if your air conditioning is broken, you need to decide now, not in 60 days, whether you can replace it. So um, there's a great opportunity to solve this, like, you know, it's a technology problem combined with like business models. But you know, that's what we're kind of struggling with. There's also, uh, you can also do it with financial engineering. California is actually yes. a leading jurisdiction in which there are things called PPAs, power purchase agreements, where the consumer can get a financed opportunity in effect to put the stuff on their roof. And they, they, it's expressed to them as a guaranteed power rate for the next 20 years. And what happens is the equipment just magically appears on their roof and it's not their investment, it's the finance company's investment. That exists, that works. It's another way to help solve that for people that can't put the money down up front. Hi, Barrett Anderson. Um, some of you may have met me this week. Um, I'm, I love what you have come up with. I completely agree that some kind of community-based AI-assisted social movement is necessary. Um, and I think that there is an opportunity here to, there's, there, there's an entire, I feel like this, this group in, and its perspective is a little bit uh, different than, for example, the generation that Al Gore himself trained, right? So there's been a lot of discussion in this group about, well, how do we convince people? How do we change their minds? You don't convince them, right? They change their minds because the people who believe already and are, are already you know, convinced are doing things and it becomes a social movement that you just can't avoid, right? Or an economic movement that you just can't avoid. Um, 
And so I wanted to just offer, you know, you know, you mentioned the 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 um, Al Gore's um, young leadership training program. I'm forgetting the name at the moment, but <clears throat> I actually participated in that program. Um, in fact, every um, World Economic Forum Global Shaper has the opportunity to do that, which I was. Um, and I want to say one thing, which is I don't think that that program did nothing, because one of the <laughs> one the, the friend you know one of the friends that I met in that program actually. Uh, became Chuck Schumer's like head of climate and was hugely like was was hugely um, influential in passing the IRA, right? So those young leaders are now in many ways coming to fruition, right? That training and so I think we're going to see an acceleration of young people coming into positions where they're finally able to leverage that their that that strategic insight. And that um, it's going to be a really interesting time in the next five years, right? Wow. The, the movement and the bell curve momentum mm -hmm. is coming, and it is here already. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to help bring that along. As far as like personal things that I, I plan to do immediately, um, I already gave John Madison my plan, plan A jacket. <laughs> <laughs> because he's going to another <laughs> conference where he wants to wear it on stage. <laughs> Um, and I also uh, am committing publicly to help create a video uh, that does carry this forward. Um, and then I also have um, Frank Luntz's personal cell number in my phone from meeting him at a conference a couple years ago. So I'm going to call him because if there's anyone who knows something about He's the guy. it's him. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Hi, Mary Jesse, and thank you all for the presentation and the work. Um, I think that unlike like when Pattern was created, you know, rather than wanting to, you know, kind of hide this away, I think this is one where it's really important to be able to, even for the people that aren't still in the room, but definitely include and update all of the fire participants and maybe it's all of the newsletter and fire films and everybody because um, like I didn't have an opportunity to go to your sessions but I'm deeply interested and want to you know so include everybody in those updates because I think everybody probably is pretty like-minded in this group about wanting to see solutions um, big plan A type solutions. And um, the second thing I was going to say is, I know, I, I didn't hear like where it landed, but I know one of your criteria, Mark, that you had at the beginning was it's gotta be technology that already exists and, you know, so we can ramp it, launch it. But there is a lot of innovation going on in this space and the, you know, really difficult, you know, solar solutions we have today that are kind of onerous are, you know, there's a lot of innovation happening. So I think we can't forget about that, you know, feeding in, you know, things that make it to market during this time frame because they're getting a lot smaller and, you know, like stuff on windows and, you know, all of these things. And they're not, you know, there's just a big wave coming of innovation. So somehow capturing that in the plan, I don't know if I missed it, but I think that's really important. And that, you know, the other thing which you guys have mentioned, and I don't know if that's also, ex is just reducing demand, you know, like there's just a, but like there's, that's a, there's a really big ROI on, mm. on that. And if you can knock, you know, 49 trillion down to, mm. you know, 30 trillion, like that's a big deal. And that kind of movement, I believe is possible with some of these, you know, inject a bit of money and you get a giant effect out like the LED lights, right? Like, you know, I mean, we still are just grossly wasteful of energy uh -oh. in this, yeah country i mean even even people you know like in here that care you know let alone people that may not be as aware right still it's so easy to just not be doing those things so you know i think that's also important i'm going to build on on what you said mary in one of our sessions i don't remember if it was first night or, or second night that we met um, we, we as a group talked about previous sort of challenges or changes that the globe has gone through and how the development of a really great product 
has helped bring that to fruition. We talked about products that came out too early and failed, mm -hmm. and then you know, 15 years later, something else came along that was really similar, but so much better in so many ways. And so I see a lot of hope in that world. Mm -hmm. um, we just announced today that we opened a new fab for our, pro our product. So like, there's a new fab coming online that's making more solar. Um, super exciting. And there's going to be more companies and you know, bringing more and more fabs to market. We talked yeah. a lot about how that ramps up in the next five years. So hold on to that hope of yeah. it's all these products. You know, the thing I heard a TED talk about or that, that, that little yeah. gadget that sticks to the window or whatever it may be. Each one of those is holding hope to build towards the solution. And it's a, it's a movement. I think using that word movement, it, I mean, that's what really it needs to be. And there, there's a lot of elements in a movement, and there's a lot of ways to contribute and getting everybody on board. Yeah, you've got the big nut, but you've got a lot of other... Um, but I, know, would, I would be careful here. Forward. I don't think anyone wants to regulate innovation. That, no, I no. Doubt. But, but there is great value in not dispersing all of your efforts and, and energies and money across everybody's pet project. That's what I'm trying to say in the beginning, right. is that we're not gonna do that. So there has to be a basic agreement of, in plan A that solar is the deal. Yeah. And then I hope that what would happen by nature would be when governments jump on and whatever else jumps on, innovators will jump in too and go, I can make that thing three times more efficient, why wouldn't we do that? Um, I think we'll see an in increased number of people doing innovation with that kind of focus. And within batteries too. Let's no, I want to make ecosystem. sure, yeah, we're keeping batteries. The whole ecosystem, yep. yeah. Bob. Good morning, I'm Bob Anderson, Managing Director of the Global Anderson Family. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank the CTO team here, and I'll tell you why. I worked 37 years in the oil business, retired, went back to my alma mater, Illinois Tech, taught a class called E-Cubed, Three-legged stool, energy, environment, and economics for 20 years. Retired from that and began delivering community uh, presentations on climate change. Three years ago, I had to prove it wasn't a hoax. Two years ago, I had a couple of flood pictures. Uh, last year, there was plenty of stuff in the newspaper to persuade people. But I was always at a loss at the end of these presentations. Say, okay, very nice presentation, Mr. Anderson. What's your solution? And I had to say, I don't have one. And thanks to you folks, I now have one. Well, well done. Um, Ragnar Cruz, um, we should continue working on, on this. Um, and uh, many might not re uh, recognize, but, and we talked in the session about it, in Europe and in Germany, there is a need now to do something. Yeah, it's, if we have four months of cold winter, our reserves go down and we need to shut off businesses with electricity. Yeah. We were able to circumvent that last winter, but next winter is coming. I think the forecast still for this winter is good, so it will not happen. Government in Germany for a year now has been working on some solutions. Just now they buy liquid gas from the US, <laughs> that's not the solution. Yeah. So uh, I think we will have a plan in Germany. It will cost, though some of the numbers are already about a trillion to actually get to 100% um, in, in Germany. And Germany already understood that it needs to have a European solution. That's something we learned. So that's unique if you compare it to the US. There in Europe is a need because of the war and because of the decision to cut off yep. Russian supply. Right. So Europe will need to do something and that can initiate, of course, um, something. And I like the session before where it's, you know, we need to have multiple countries really doing something. Mm -hmm. um, and so, we will need to come up with a plan in Europe which can initiate something as it did at the beginning of the 2000s when we in Germany actually incentivized installments of, right. of solar. So that's number one, and that's something we can take into account in coming up with a plan. Yeah? And then, of course, it will drive more demand. I think 
also for the audience here, what we learned during our sessions was China already is, first of all, producing about 90% of the solar globally and actually implements like 50% already on a yearly basis of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so they're smarter just now than anybody else in the world. Yeah, so looking at kind of competition. Mm -hmm. And we just need to understand how important um, it is. Mm -hmm. And today, and uh, therefore now when we think about marketing, we have those films showing what is going to happen in the next 10, 20, 30 years. That's clearly um, um, one thing. And we can leverage that. There's now also enough technology out there to film and have Trump, Biden, Jin, whoever, whom, saying the time to invest in solar is today. Yeah, so, and use it for marketing purposes. Yeah. And uh, AI. You're saying make a deep fake of the ex-president. Yeah. yeah, OK, and, that's a good and, idea. And also <laughs> interesting is, is here was a gentleman. He knew the price he is paying actually for electricity. In Germany, many didn't. Now most of them know. Yeah, we paid 29 cents, and it went up to we are paying now 39 cents per kilowatt hour. Mm. But many are paying 59, so it doubled. That has cost, for example, in Germany, that a lot of households now install solar on their balconies. Yeah. And uh, anyways, that's something we cannot scale, really because of, of, of many reasons. So therefore, I think here we had a great starting point. We should continue working on that. And I think every one of us of the SNS and FIRE community also knows some specialists who understand the different technologies and so on who could also contribute to actually help to get to the right numbers and more and more to a plan how could we execute on that? Yeah, because I think we need to also show and provide our governments with a solution yeah, and then get private capital um, activated to help driving it yeah, and leverage it on social and so on to show there's a solution. We just need to execute on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mark, Great. we're over, but we're not that bad over there. Great, okay, I'll be very, very quick yep. here. Thank you so much, Mark Godsey. I know this is very controversial and I'm probably gonna to add to it a little bit, but in the spirit of love and sort of pushing a little fruit basket out, um, this is an enormous, enormous um, problem, challenge. Um, there was an enormous problem challenge uh, done a few years ago named Pattern Computer. Mark, you did an absolutely outstanding job putting a whole bunch of people together, creating something that you know, had never been done before. And again, in the, in the spirit of just pushing a fruit basket forward, I would gently and lovingly suggest you might want to consider maybe transitioning <laughs> and, and, uh, and taking something like this on. Yeah. I'll think about that with my team this afternoon at 4 o'clock. <laughs>